Well, I very much hope to be sitting in the next British Parliament, whenever the general election comes, with my next guest, not just because uh, he's a good friend of the mother of all talk shows, but because I just know he would be an incredibly effective voice for the people of Blackburn, who he seeks to represent, for the people of Britain, and for the good causes across the world. His erudition, his wit, his skill on his feet, his, uh, his, his background as a British diplomat uh, in the Foreign Office, as an ambassador in Uzbekistan, I think he's going to make it. And so it seems, does the Daily Telegraph, the London Times, and every other right-wing declining, failing, fading rag across the country also seem to be worried about it? Because they're writing about him almost as much as they're writing about me. He is the Honourable Craig Murray. Welcome back to the show, Craig. I'll see you on Saturday in Blackburn at the conference we're both uh, addressing. Uh, but let's, uh, before we get on to uh, British political matters, talk about Julian Assange, your friend and mine. Uh, how seriously are you taking uh, the mumbled words uh, of, uh, of the doltish uh, US president in the Rose Garden this afternoon? I'm sorry, George, you've actually got me at a disadvantage. I've been actually on a boat all afternoon, which I, I got off a few moments ago, so I've not seen it. Well, it's a most splendid uh, way to uh, avoid uh, watching Joe Biden. I uh, <laughs> wish I'd been on a boat this afternoon. But here's what happened. Uh, the Australian government, parliament, uh, asked the US and UK authorities to cease the proceedings against Julian and to set him free. So um, Joe Biden was walking uh, along the Rose Garden path uh, when one of the journalists in the press corps shouted, what's your response to the Australian uh, appeal uh, to drop the charges against Julian Assange? And Joe Biden answered without looking uh, to the journalist. He answered clearly, volubly enough, but whether or not he was thinking straight remains to be seen. But he answered, we are considering it. So the British news is leading with US considering dropping the charges against Julian Assange. Now that may turn out to be a false dawn. On the other hand, it may be one of those days where you have to remember that you were on a boat quite oblivious to the news that our friend was about to be freed. Yeah, that would be amazing. Um it's interesting because Biden has always before stuck to the line that it's up to the Justice Department, it's nothing to do with him, it's nothing to do with the White House. And um, he seems to have that line quite off pat. That seems to have been his remembered response uh, to anything to do with Julian Assange. So that that is a very significant change. Um, I know we we all know that Biden's no longer fully on top of his mental faculties, so you can't always take anything spontaneous from him as being any more than fumbling for, for a response. But I think that's so different from what's come out of him before um, that it, it must have meaning. And uh, it, it really is very interesting. I've... I've never had any doubt that the Americans don't want him back before the presidential election, because it's going to be another big headache for Biden to have the entire media angry over freedom of speech issues if Julian Assange arrives in the United States in chains. Um, so delay, as we've continued to see, you know, delay in the process at the High Court and Julian remaining in Belmarsh uh, is what I've been expecting to to see. Um, and it may be, again, this is simple appeasement while that continues to happen. We, we, we will have to wait and see. I spoke uh, earlier in the show uh, with our colleague Chris Hedges, uh, who speculated 
that uh, not only that the Americans definitely don't want him back in an election year, uh, they don't want this, uh, the optics of a journalist in handcuffs, in chains, uh, coming down uh, aircraft steps. They've got so many problems already, do the Democrats. Uh, but that uh, it may be that these assurances that the High Court asked the U.S. for were deliberately asked on the basis that the U.S. cannot and will not accept them, will not give those assurances. If that were to come to pass, Julian gets leave to appeal, presumably remaining in the bowels of Belmarsh. If Biden, after consideration of the Australian appeal, effectively drops the charges or drops the most serious of those charges at least, well, we might be partying with Julian as soon as he's fit enough to do so and much sooner than we expected. Well, that would be fantastic. I mean, it's been 12 years of, of struggle uh, campaigning uh, for Julian, uh, campaigning uh, to get him out, first from what was in effect imprisonment in the embassy, and then from Belmarsh jail these last five years. Um, and uh, as you know, I'm, I'm very close to Stella and the family, and, and seeing the, the toll, the, the human toll it has had on them and on um, Gabriel, his brother, and John, his father, um, you know, has really been uh, very, very tough um, emotionally. Um, so the the notion of him being re reunited with his family uh, would be simply amazing. But I'm not going to get um, too hopeful um, immediately on, on a few words out of the mouth of, of Biden, because there just has been no previous indication. I, and there's been nothing from the Justice Department so far to indicate any easing up uh, from the American side. So this this is entirely new, if true, but, uh, but we have to be a bit cautious and wait to see what comes. Now, uh, talking a few words, you've been allowed very few words uh, from some of the media that are growing increasingly interested in your parliamentary bid to come and sit beside me in the House of Commons. Uh, when we're over the target, we experience the flack, of course. <clears throat> but were you surprised at the uh, interest of the, of the national broadsheet uh, media in your imminent candidature in Blackburn? It, it, it's extraordinary. I'm, I'm, I'm very happy to say that I think the vast, vast majority of the good people of Blackburn have got far too much sense to pay to read the Times or the Telegraph anyway. So I, I, I don't think it's actually going to reach any of them. But in fact, I was quite flattered by the Times article. The Times article quoted a number of things uh, that I had said, uh, which obviously they expected their readers to be horrified by. But they are things I'm quite proud and happy i said in which i stand by today you know i said that what happened on the 7th of october was a reaction to 75 years of vicious oppression of the palestinians by the israeli state uh and i said that for a single day the boot had been on the other foot um now those those statements are simply simply true i i, I stand by them i don't condone random violence against civilians by anyone but all occupied nations in, in in the all occupied peoples in the, the history of their armed resistance against their occupiers um uh, always end up you know in acts of of armed resistance and that's what we saw on the 7th of october and the the idea that the you know the times thinks it was horrified people that i i i, I state such a plain truth i think is is quite amusing well, the good news is that Rupert Murdoch is uh, turning in record losses. I don't know if you caught up with the News Corp uh, latest uh, figures. Uh, the Sun has lost £54 million in one single year. And their uh, um, talk TV outfit, uh, having come off the air 
gone on to the internet uh, is now sacking some of their biggest names and biggest paychecks. Uh, the, the one and only Vanessa Feltz was fired today after her show because they can no longer afford her £800,000 a year salary for a show routinely attracting between 10 and 12,000 viewers. Uh, so the Times might not be with us for very much longer, at least not under its present ownership. But doesn't what you just said there illustrate the extent to which these journalists and the politicians, symbiotically living off each other, uh, are living in a, a very small bubble? And what they imagine will have the public clutching their pearls about is actually quite often already the prevailing orthodoxy and the perceived truth and wisdom amongst the great majority of the population. I, I think that's definitely true. And I, I think Gaza has underlined the terrible genocide in Gaza has um, underlined the distinction between the political and media class and the general population. The fact that the political and media class no longer represent anybody. The, you know, they have their own very strange set of views, of which ardent Zionism as a kind of membership ticket for entry to the political class is is is, is one of them, which is simply not shared by the general um Population and the, the political and media class together are are dependent on on the billionaires uh, in whose pocket the vast majority of them are, um, and and they reflect the views of those billionaires. They don't reflect the views of the general public in any way, and they don't represent the views of the general public in any way. Which is why we're seeing this vast wealth gap uh, growing uh, where. You know, we are going, the, the Financial Times was saying that within the next five years, the world will have its first trillionaires. And, and at the same time, even in a highly developed economy like the UK, we have children who cannot eat properly. Um, and the, uh, that can only happen in a system where there is no connection between the people and the political class, and the ordinary people have no ability to affect what's happening. That's why we have to smash this two-party system where the only choice people believe they have at elections is between two conservative parties. Now, let me uh, bowl uh, uh, um, uh, an unexpected ball at you. Uh, as you know, I've given up Scottish politics, so I don't raise this for any partisan reason. I have no intention of being involved in Scottish politics again. But the uh, first week of the SNP Green Government's Hate Act, the new hate law, has gotten off to a simply disastrous start, uh, it seems to me. Uh, the people are reporting each other in, in hundreds, if not thousands, of cases. And the police are simply overwhelmed. The police have more or less said they cannot enforce this law. What's your take on that? It's a crazy law. I, I'm, I'm, it always was. It's extremely illiberal. It, um, it specifically states it includes performance, for example. So it includes plays and films and comedy. Uh, it includes the act of communicating uh, hate speech from one person to another person, which could include, for example, if you were to um, give somebody um, a piece of music uh, which contains words that would be defined as hate speech, which would probably include a great many rap songs, for example, would, would probably fall foul of this law. Uh, the act of giving the music as a Christmas present or whatever uh, would be a crime. And then you have a fact that under Scottish law, anything that can be seen on the internet and read on the internet in Scotland, if read on the internet in Scotland, is deemed to be published in Scotland. So it covers all communications worldwide which are seen in Scotland. Um, so it's no surprise that the police had 8,000 reports in one in one week. It, it, it's a dreadful 
piece of legislation which is totally illiberal um, and, and, and really does, I'm afraid to say, uh, reflect the, this dreadful sort of nanny state attitude on, on, on the part of the government in Scotland. Well, uh, I'm actually in Scotland right now. I'm speaking to you in foreign parts on a quayside. Uh, I've got my wood-burning stove on, and I'm speaking freely to you, uh, whether the SNP government likes it or not. So let's hope I don't get the knock on the door. Craig, I'll see you on Saturday, God willing. Go safely. I know you had a little accident. Uh, tell us, uh, how's your shoulder, your arm? I'm progressing less well than I would like. I'm, I'm seeing the surgeon again on, on Friday, but it looks like it's going to be uh, another week or two. But there's a huge amount of soft tissue damage. They've got the bones together again, but uh, it's, it's all taking some time to heal. Well, we wish you all the best. Hope to see you at the weekend. Craig Murray, Honourable Craig Murray, former British ambassador, prospective parliamentary candidate for the Workers' Party of Britain in the great parliamentary constituency of Blackburn. Thanks for joining us.